everyone, um, welcome to the keynote for WCS's Fall Banquet. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed dinner and dessert. Um, now, we have Rita Patel-Jackson, the head of marketing for GE's healthcare and AI initiatives. Um, and I'm going to let her talk about her work and all introduce right. herself. I'd love to learn how to turn this on. Yeah. So, thank you so much for speaking. Oh, my, thank you. Wow. It's been 30 years, guys, since I've been, and they did, this did not exist, right? We're talking about this. <laughs> this did not exist. We lived in the DCL lab back there. I'm seeing some nods over there. Yes, and we survived, right? High five. <laughs> I'm going to, Russ over there graduated at the same time I did. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, um, for welcoming me. This has been an incredible day. I really enjoyed talking to all of you that were at the office hours. Did you keep me young? and energized, and um, I have children your age, so I have hope that there is a lot, I mean, they didn't go to U of I, unfortunately, but um, they're doing their own thing just like you guys are. So I'm, um, the way I want to run today, I do a lot of these um, talks, and I mentor and coach a lot of young talent, and I love, love seeing all of you young ladies. Uh, nothing against the gentlemen, but you know, when I went to computer science, and I'll show you a picture, I could probably count the number of women on my hand that we would see throughout the day. And this is just overwhelmingly beautiful. I love it. Um, so I'm going to start out with my favorite quote. And unfortunately, I did not find my tiara because I just moved from the Chicago suburbs to downtown Chicago, downsizing, empty nesting, whatever we want to call it. Um, I would like to call it adulting because that's what my children call it. So I'm going to go to adulting. And um, so this phrase is, there's nothing wrong with being a princess. We just have to think that girls can build their castles, too. And I unfortunately could not take a picture of the house that we built that I just left um, that looked like a castle, but nothing like this. And I want to start out with just with an inspirational story. And I think a lot of you heard it, so I apologize for the ones that were there this afternoon. But um, Debbie was a startup, Goldie Blocks, and she started this. She has as a mom. She was uh, one of our um, uh, partners that I worked with when I worked for IBM. And the reason that she ended up creating Goldie Blocks was, um, how many of you girls, when you walked down the toy aisle, just interacted, because I'm a very interactive person, uh, what did you see when you walked down the toy aisle? Come on, just spit it out. Barbies. You saw cars in the girl aisle? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I want to be in your toy store. In the girls' aisle, right? Remember, if you go to Toys R Us, which might not exist, and when you go to the boys' aisle, come on, boys, what did you guys have? Uh-huh. Legos, Tinker Toys, right? And so what happens is you, as children, you have this spatial, you need to really learn, and you learn at the age of like two or three or four, right? And we do a lot of these girls who code and all of this starting in kindergarten. She believed that it needed to start sooner than that. It needed to start in the toy aisle. So she created a company which really is all about little girls being building builders. So it's OK to be a girl so you can wear your princess tiara. And you can also build things, too. So it's all about the spatial mind that you have that we don't foster as children. And so that's what she did. And I love this because I've been my entire career, I've been building. And whether it's not with my hands, with my brain, with whatever, I follow the net, net new technology trend. And I think U of I kind of did that to me. It's, it's like a curse. Because I was here in computer science when we had, you know, the supercomputer and all these cool things were happening on campus. So you really were excited about it when people didn't even know what computers were. So that's my thing. And I, you know, the one thing I'm going to leave you guys with, because I'm going to start with this and I'll end with this, is life is a journey. And mine definitely, we talked about this this afternoon, to get from point A, which was here, not in this room, but somewhere else on campus, probably on the quad somewhere or in my sorority, is where my journey started and my love for, I would say, technology, because at the time, what we taught, say computer science today was very different than what computer science was when I was growing up. Um, we were still building computers, right? And in 1984, which is when I came to the University of Illinois, from my little tiny suburb of Mayberry, Lyle, Illinois, you know, from a very protective Indian family. Yes, I'm an American-born Indian, so there were very few of me back in the 80s. The Mac, the very first thing is Apple introduced that same year an Apple Macintosh, which I saw a lot of you guys have. And the more important thing is the mouse. Literally, not the one that's touching the one, touch one, a hand mouse. And so that actually brought computing 
into the mainstream because before computers were always something that businesses did, science, research, academics did. It actually brought computer into mainstream life, right? But it also, one thing that I want to, I'm going to go back to the castle, is something that always catches me off guard is that when I look back in the commercials for Apple, because I'm in marketing now, you look back at what they did, what they learned, how they launched this net new technology making a market, all of the computers and all of the ads for Apple were men and little boys. And so that got me thinking, you know, and it's going back to what Debbie and I talk about when I talk with her with Goldie Blocks. It starts young, it starts at the TV, right? So one thing I want you guys to think about is that whenever you're doing whatever you do, think about how it will transpire into everybody. Like, you know, it, diversity is so important. Diversity across everything, right? It adds. And so I think that was the challenge because when I went to U of I, this was my posse. You guys call them tribe now, I think. But that was it. There was about four of us, like four groups like this. And this was my five. We were the five, right? And we're all very diverse. And as you can tell, I was a sorority girl. And uh, I was, yes, I was a Chi Omega. And I was one of the first engineers there. Maybe there were two of us. Yeah, maybe two, three. Until my family started to grow and we were all engineers. And I was probably one of the Asian, first Asians. There was about five Asians in the entire sorority system, if you can believe that or not, at U of I back then. They knew them all. You know, you knew who everybody was. And so it was an interesting time to be in computer science. And we made it. This was our, oh my gosh, we made it through CS, right? All of the classes from all the fun times we had to the senior project, which we had a blast at, to trying to figure out Friday night how we're going to get a computer to do the programming that's due on Monday morning, uh, and standing in line, which you guys don't have to do anymore. I know, you're looking at me like I'm crazy, and you're laughing. But we did. You had to get up in the morning, or you have to go and sign in over at DCL to see which computer you're going to get. So it didn't make computing easy, right? And then on top of that, in 1984, and when, or 88 when we graduated, um, back in the 80s, it's interesting. 37%, I think, is the number, and you, everybody else can probably correct me, um, were women going into technology. And now we're down to like 13, 12 to 13%. So I keep going back to like, what happened from when I thought this was my tribe and we're starting something new, to what's happening to technology today when in, in the world we live in today, in the business world, we're going to have a shortage by 2020. There's not going to be enough people in the technology, computer science, data science world to do all the work that needs to happen. So if you're looking for job security, this is the place to be, I'm telling you. It's awesome. We all need, we need more and more people um, like you in, in, in the workforce. So promote it, you know, start young. But um, I have to tell you, one of the things that I learned being with my posse and the diversity that we had in a world where we go into the lecture and sometimes you're the only female, sometimes the only minority female, and they don't know what to do with you, right? And you learn to like adapt. I think so the one thing that I want to leave you with is no matter how uncomfortable you are in the space, stay with it and learn to adapt. Because if you strongly love it, because I did, I love technology. I didn't know that back then. I just knew it was something cool and sexy and new that I wanted to learn. And, um, and I liked making things, I liked to break things and I liked to fix things. So that was the thing I knew. And I didn't want to be in engineering, like building electrical engineering, electricity scared me. Um, didn't want to do industrial. I, I thought it was too much, you know. And so I'm like, oh, computer science, let's do this. Um, but really, if you love it, go for it. I mean, this was 30 years ago. This is, it was incredible. Um, first job out of college, when you're a computer science person coming out of college, there's about a handful of co companies that you really wanted to go to. I got one of them. It looks like you were there too. AT&T. I scored. AT&T Bell Labs. They had computers. They had, you know, supercomputer, not supercomputers, but they had like machines all over the place. I'm in. So I go, and you know, you have to start somewhere, right? So you come out of college, we're energetic, we're smart, we're all over the place. All of a sudden you go in, you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing, right? I got this thing. It's something called a 5ESS switch, which probably nobody here knows about but you. And I was programming on the 5ESS switch, creating what you guys take for granted right now, which is call forwarding and call waiting. Back then, that was transformational. And I learned very quickly that you really have to sit back and just listen. And, you know, I did a lot of listening, which was difficult when you're a senior in computer science and you're trying to, you know, do class projects and put your, you know, lean in. 
Um, I had to do a lot of listening, and something unusual happened. I was 22, 23 at the time, and I became a manager of a bunch of engineers. Remember, I'm a female engineer, and uh, with a bunch of engineers that were all men. And it was such an interesting adventure for me, because a lot of them had children my age, it seems like. But what I learned was I, you know, they taught me a lot. They taught me to listen. They taught me to um, really be knowledgeable about what I know and to be, you know, to voice it, right? And so I think that we talked about this earlier, gaining respect. I think that's the one thing that I learned is that you never, you have to earn the respect. It's not given to you. So just because you're given a title or you're given this project or you're given something, you've got to gain the respect. And the way to gain it is to know something and know it well. And so that's what I ended up doing. And as I was doing that, I learned that, you know, I might like the business side of this just a little bit more than I liked the programming because when you're programming, back then, we did not hit the punch cards. I passed that up. But we had sheets of paper. So you would be programming, and in order to de debug, you would have to literally look at these sheets of paper and look at I, I just, that drove me nuts. So I'm like, you know what? There's this whole thing called systems engineering back then. I think I need to go do that. So I went and I applied. I did my GMAT, got into DePaul in marketing and international business. And it was an amazing and interesting thing. Because the other thing I learned is the engineering school or the um, technology classes back then did not prepare us like they do today, which you guys are so lucky, in presentation skills. So we learned how to program really well. And we learned how to design code really well. But what we were not really good at and I, I used to sweat, like, you know, you'd go around the room in a meeting and they would call on me and I'd be like, oh my God, what do I say, what do I say? You know, they didn't prepare us for that. And they, not just anything, like if you were an engineer or you were in computer science, they really didn't believe in the, in the, in the cross, right? You stayed in your discipline. And so a lot of us went through, business, went through this transformation of what do you do and how do you learn? You either learn innately or you go back to school and, you, and I, I particularly went and got my master's degree in an in, in MBA. Um, but one thing, another thing I keep telling my children, be grateful that you have to do those PowerPoint presentations that nobody likes to do. Be grateful that they put you in front of a class when you're in junior high, because those skills I had to learn in my 20s, how to communicate. I mean, I, I knew I had stuff in my head, but what we lacked was the ability to transfer. So the educational system has come so far from back in the 80s where we were really deep, you know, you went in and you just went deep. And now I think what's happening is we're seeing this coming out of, as I'm looking at, at new hires and, you know, we're hiring all the time, is the, the incredible talent, not only in the technology side, but also in the ability to communicate. And so that's the thing that I learned is that the ability, I wanted to, to, to learn how to uh, communicate. From there, I went to Motorola. And I'll tell you why I went to Motorola. Went there because I wanted to get a cell phone. And back then it was called a bag phone or a brick. That's literally the only reason I went. I dealt with the 45 minute commute to get up there because I didn't want to program and they were offering me a job called, um, so I was a product planner. I think that was the title they gave me. But it translates that into product management. So that's the term that we use now. And I was like, I'm going to go do this. And it was cell site configuration, which was really similar. Instead of doing landlines, you do cell set, cells. And I got a bag phone. So I'm sitting here cool in my car with the bag phone. And, you know, and that's what I did. And I learned as I was going to get my, I know you guys are all laughing. Do you guys remember back phones? Anybody back there? Right? The brick, right? That was cool. And we used to think it was really awesome to carry this brick around in our phone. I mean, our purses. I mean, the purses had to be big. And now I'm looking at these phones going, oh my gosh, this is insane. But, um, you know, in Motorola, I was at getting my MBA. And I, what I learned at that point in time was the, the ability to, learn the business side of the house, that you can still, I was still doing technology, but it taught me how to do PowerPoint presentations because we had Macintoshes then, and be able to take what I was, what we knew how, what we were doing and being able to communicate to a, to a external person, right? So instead, of, it took me out of my development environment, took me out of my research environment, and brought me up into the business side, and along with that, along the journey came my MBA. And then I got my MBA, and I got bored, and there's this thing called uh, wireless that started to come out from, you know, I learned all about that when I was doing cell site configurations. And I learned about this thing called two-way messaging. 
And I'm like, I got to go do that. So I found a small startup in Chicago, and um, I went and I joined them, just out of the blue. I got my MBA, went and I joined this small company. It was a consulting company, and they ended up creating uh, software, and it was a two-way messenger. So um, learned a ton. It was a big, big risk. I left my big corporate job, went to a startup, was the 10th employee, invested in the company, um, learned how to do probably almost everything, um, from contracting to sales, joined as a product marketing person, but ended up doing development because I knew how to code. Um, a little bit of everything. And I learned how to run, a, how a company runs. Like I went from, you know, working at a big company to working in a smaller, tiny, you know, we ended up being 50 before we, we went bankrupt, and that's another story I'll, I'll keep going into. Um, and to take risks. But I learned, I, I grew a ton in the two years that I was there. I also got pregnant. Um, I grew, I learned, and I learned also how to get noticed. So that's the thing where I think I learned my voice. So when we were talking, I was a very, believe it or not, um, quiet, reserved, introvert in college. And I got my voice. I learned my voice. So it was all those things, the business school, learning how to present, being in a small company, being forced to talk to customers, um, and, and getting noticed. Because that's what you had to do when you were in a startup. It's scrappy. You kind of had to do a little bit of everything. You have to get noticed. You have to lean in. You have to push your way forward. And um, that, that really taught me a ton. And it was really walking a tightrope. Um, my girlfriend found that picture for me. Because that's what you always did. You walked every day. You walked into the office. And you're like, OK, what am I going to do now? Let's just not fall off, right? And then um, a funny thing happened is the owner, we went bankrupt. And we had no more money to pay payroll. And so we had to, I had to lay everybody off. Now, I'm in my early 30s. I'm actually not even 30. I'm 29. And um, I had to lay off people. Very first time I've ever done that and having a grown man cry. So I know it sounds horrible, right? Um, compassion. I learned a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion during that time. But we sold the company, the software, to a company called Racotech that then took it to BlackBerry. So back in the day, I don't know if you guys know about BlackBerry Messenger, BBM. That was the technology. You know, I didn't create it, but that's what we did. So um, everybody, you know, it's, there's a happy ending for everything, right? You got to look at it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I learn? Hey, it's a predecessor to BBM. And then I'm pregnant, right? And I'm going to this company. I know, look, isn't this the coolest picture? Because I'm Asian Indian. So everybody, you know, even though I have Jackson as a last name. Um, I was pregnant when we shut the company down. And I'm like, gosh, I have nine months that this baby is going to grow in me. And what am I going to do, right? So before I go into that story, we all cross this bridge. So everybody that's in the back over there that have children, there's never is a good time to have children. I, I learned that, and I got that advice from actually one of my MBA teachers. Because she was pregnant teaching, and she had a corporate job. And I'm like, oh my gosh. She goes, you know what? You just make it work. You want to have children? Have children. Just not. I tell my son, I am not old enough to be a grandma, so not yet. Go be in your 20s, enjoy your life. But if you want to have kids now, go for it. But I just think enjoy life for a little bit. But everybody has a time and a pay place, and it's your path. And it was mine. And I was at this juncture. I, you know, I shut the company down. I'm interviewing. I had a couple job offers. What do I do? Do I step back into the career world, or do I go and do what a lot of my friends were doing and do the mommy track? And I'm like, you know what? I'm not ready yet because another shiny thing came in, a company called Platinum Technologies that had the coolest, coolest guy. His name was Flip as a CEO. He's a serial entrepreneur. And um, I was like the 200th employee, and I got to start the product marketing organization for the very first time for DB2. So this got me into the data world. I left the technology world, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this whole thing called analytics and big data, I'm all in. Let's go try this. I'm telling you, I follow that golden nugget, you know, shine it in front of me, and I follow it. And so I went in, and I, I made the decision. I was all in, and I said, I'm going to go do this. And then the funny thing happened. I had one baby. 17 months later, I had another one, and I'm at Platinum. And loving life, doing cool things at the top of my career. I became an executive, helping to run the company. You know, and Flip has got a ponytail. We're doing all these cool things. It's in the, you know, it's, it's, it's in the software boom, right? It's, it's the early 2000s, before the dot-com. And so I had this teeter-totter. You know, it's like, what do I do? You know, I'm at work. I'm this wonderful executive. I'm having a blast. We're doing this thing called big data, analytics, databases, information. So cool. And I come home, and I got these two crying kids, and I've got dinner. I got laundry. I got, oh, yeah, what am I going to do? 
And you know what? You kind of make it work. And so what I did is, I, it, it's the balance. And, and the one thing that I learned during those, those wonderful years of being a mom and a young mom, I loved it, was um, you got to find it and you got to create it. No one's going to create the balance for you. You've got to ask for it. You've got to have boundaries. And I think it goes for anything and everything. So one of the things that happened is when I was at Platinum and I had my daughter and I was out going on a business trip, I had to go out of the country and I just freaked out. Went into my boss's office and I'm like, I'm done. I'm not coming into the office two days a week. I'm going to work from home. And I demanded, I just asked, I said, I, you want me? I want to do this job, but I can't come into the office. I need to spend some time with my daughter. It's crazy getting two kids out the door without having spit up all over me and going, I, I, I can't do this. I got to I do that. So that's what happened. I learned about balances and I learned about the choices and, and the choices that I would have to make. And um, a funny thing happened is I kept going and, I, and a year later um, I missed uh, an event with my daughter and she was kindergarten, not even kindergarten, she was a preschool. And I went to flip and I said, you know what, I really want to work, but I want to be a mom more, but I want to do both. And so he says, you know what, what about two days a week, special projects? And what, that, what I had to do then, though, I had to give up my executive title, I had to give up my team, and I made a choice. I'm like, you know what, I want to work because we're in a cool technology space. I don't want to give this up. I want to stay smart. But and I also want to spend time with my children. And so I asked for it. You know what, what happened is they brought a playpen into the office, not just for me, but into, like, the work area. And this is in the 1990s, right? Like 19, my kids are 95 and 97, so right around your age, right? Maybe a little older than everybody in the room. And they brought a playpen into the room. They, they t encouraged not only me, but other women that were in technology and in, in similar situations to bring their children into work. So we started this bring your children to work day, right? So it was this thing where we would bring our children in. They would, you know, and they started a daycare eventually in the building as well. But a lot of that wasn't just me. It was a, a couple of us women my posse at the time, or my tribe, we went in and we were all young women, we were all in technology, and we all wanted to keep working and we wanted to be with our children. And so that's kind of, if I could leave you with one, is you have to ask for the balance, you have to ask for it, you can, it'll never come to you, right? If you wait for the right time to have whatever you want in your life, and it's not children, for me it was children. Um, you, you've got to grab it, take it, and ask for it. And, and that's one thing I learned, it was not easy, I think I had the cold, hot sweats and cold sweats every time I was going into the office asking for something new and setting my boundaries. Um, but when I was off, I was off, and that was non-negotiable, and it still is. My family's number one, um, even though they're in college and they're, my son calls, I'm in. And um, I know I went to Greece, right? It's for the moment. There you go. Ask me to go to Greece, I'll go. Um, and then a funny thing happened. We um, got acquired by CA, Computer Associates, still part-time. I was on vacation at the time. Bloodbath. Like, I walk in, and nobody there, and they said, Rita, we, we need you. So it was the CEO of the company, and um, he was in jail, by the way, Stephen Richards, all the long story with Google Computer Associates. Um, and so they, um, what happened is he says, we need you to stay, and we want you to rebuild the company. I said, all right, fine. Here's my rules. I'm, I'm working three days a week, two days in the office, one day at home. That's it. Non-negotiable. If you want me, this is what you got. And so we made it work. And he promoted me to be an executive vice president, believe it or not. I don't know how that happened, but it happened. And, um, and we rebuilt the team, and we had a blast. And the other thing I asked for was when I was traveling, which I did a lot of because we're rebuilding the team, was um, when I traveled, I asked to bring my children with me. I just did. I, didn't, I just asked. I didn't think it would happen. So if I was gone for more than a week to two weeks, they would give me an extra room. I had to pay for travel and everything, but they would give me an extra room, and I would get to bring my kids. So my daughter, for I think the first year of her life, I think all of her clothes came from Paris because I lived in, I had to go between Paris, London, Chicago. Paris, London, Chicago. What do you do on the, in the evenings? You don't go to dinner. You're going, taking the stroller out with the kid. What do you want to do? You want to go shopping? Okay, let's go. So, I, you know, I learned that. And then what happened is, every, and every time you will get this at some point in your career, young ladies, you will get this thing called Queen Bee Syndrome. There will always be this one female that doesn't believe in pushing other women up. They want to squash them. You'll always find them. Stay away from them. But they exist out there. I hate to say it, but they do. And that's what I had. I had a woman that called me on my birthday. My birthday is at the end of December. I was in Florida vacation with the kids. And she says, your full-time job is now 
your part-time job is now full-time, and we need you to come into the office every day. I'm like, thank you, but no thank you. I'll take my package, and I'm going to go. I'm going to stay home with the children. So I decided to stay home with the children for three years. And I did a lot of, a lot, I, I did not nothing, the opposite of nothing. Um, I volunteered. I started my own business. I did a lot of consulting because back then, now, we started this HTML thing called coding websites. Kind of easy. Not paper things. I mean, you can HTML create a website pretty easy these days. So I started doing website design for, for companies, small startups. Um, I think I became president of the Homeowners Association. I did every school party possible. I became party planner mom. Read a party is the name that they came up with after that. So they needed a party. That was me. And uh, I became school board member, and I became very passionate about education and STEM with young ladies because I had one at this point. And um, it bothered the heck out of me that every time she wanted to, because she's very smart, and so is my son, but we'd go down, and there was no Legos for her, and we go into the school, and, you know, they were just transforming, and, you know, you have iPads and things like that. We were transforming into that, but I was encouraging them to really promote STEM in the kindergarten, first grade, second grade kind of thing, right? And it still, in the late 90s, wasn't the norm in a lot of the school districts. And so that was my push. That was my passion, is that, you know, I'm an engineer. I'm a computer science. I've been doing this for years. And it just bothers me that a lot of these girls are out not thinking it's cool, because I think it's cool. So we were, I worked on programs to try to tear us, tear us in programming, right? Little, getting little girls to come in and doing little programs at the library. You know, simple, simple, simple things. Um, and then I got bored, and my husband told me that I needed to um, stop spending money on babysitters, and if I was going to go actually do some things, I should probably go back into, you know, instead of going to try to find new things, maybe I should go find a career again. Um, and my children were older. They were, didn't need me as much. So what did I do? Next cool thing, a company called IBM was starting and they've been around, but they were transforming into something called information management, which is what I left three years ago, but back then it was called database management. When, and big data, analytics, where all the buzzwords coming out, I'm like, I'm all in, come on, let me go. But I started at a very low level because I learned that when I was an executive, I had to give up a lot. And I wasn't able to code, or not code, but I was able to dig my hands in and do the technology activities that I really wanted to do. I was really doing a lot of um, people managing, I call it babysitting sometimes, um, and so I took a, a job that was actually very incredible. We were putting um, analytics into different industries, and I chose telecommunications, media, and entertainment, which was really cool. I had to go to Hollywood. And, um, and energy and utilities at the time when we were really doing um, smart cities and smart energy, and um, really helped transform. And then what, a funny thing kind of happens, and it was advice I got from a woman at, when I worked at Platinum Technologies who cold turkey, the CMO, left her job. And I'm like, why are you leaving? She goes, my kid is uh, young, I want to go. I got here once, I'll get here again. So a funny thing happens is when you learn all those skills back that you didn't realize that you had, starting at University of Illinois, being one of the few females in a very incredibly awesome you know, industry, but still very male-dominated, all of those skills led me to being recognized very quickly, and I started to crawl up that corporate ladder and move around. I was there about 11 years. And uh, I was sitting on a plane, and I got to do some really cool things with academics. We were bringing technology and, um, at the time, commerce into the curriculum so that when you're doing, believe it or not, in marketing, there's a tech stack. So if you like to program or you like to be you know, in software and you don't want to go into something very industrial, you can do software in marketing because there's an entire marketing tech stack. Um, and so what happened is um, I was doing some things with the academics, which is something I love. Um, especially in the STEM space, promoting that, um, you know, yes, 25 years later, here we are, right? And, and it, there's more and more and more women in technology. Let's just keep going, right? I also learned, um, because I mentor a lot of women, is that two years into their career, up to two to five years, we drop off, 56%. We lose our talent. And I was questioning, like, why is that? And it wasn't just a comp... At, IBM it was all over, right? You lose women at a certain point in their careers. And it, it was why. And I'm going back to the Platinum CA days, right? You, we feel that we have to make this choice. And I'm going to encourage all of you, you do not. You don't have to make a choice. It's not, 
one thing or another. Just find, if you're bored with what you're doing, find something else. 11 years at IBM, I would say I had about six different jobs doing six different things in six different technologies, still in computer science. Marketing, I learned marketing, I learned operations, I learned offering management, I learned um, finance, which so was not my thing because I don't like accounting. Um, I, I did a little bit of sales, didn't like that either. I like to stay in my comfort zone. I learned a lot about um, what I don't like and what I like. So what I had the opportunity to do, which I didn't have in all of the other companies, was really explore all the different parts of the business. And I could do that because of the startup that I had. So I understood what everything was and how they were interconnected. And I think it was about 10 years, nine years into my career, I decided I wanted to go do something shiny new again. Um, I was sitting on a plane going to California, and the, the general manager or something called IBM Watson sits next to me. Didn't know that's what, he, what he's doing. I was about to leave. It's interview, going for an interview, actually. He goes, hey, you want to start the ecosystem for Watson? I'm like, wait, you're talking about the Jeopardy thing? Heck yeah. I'm in. Didn't even know you guys were expanding the group. So I got so fortunate, and I, I you know, had to pinch myself. Because when I was here at the computer lab, 1988, I took a class where I did something in AI. I mean, we were talking about AI. It was there, but then we went into this dry spell. They call it, you know, the dark ages of AI. And all of a sudden, I'm coming back to like, you know, 25 years later, and here it is again. And this time, it's not how. It's not, you know, taking over the world. We're going to actually put artificial intelligence into everybody's hands. That was Ginny's mission, and I was all in. My job was to find startups, which I love to do, and I love little small companies, find startups that wanted to build um, leveraging artificial intelligence and cognitive computing. And every month, Ginny would give us a different industry. So because if you're going to, typically what technology companies do is they do from B2B, you go to another technology company or you go to Citibank or you do AI and all these different um, tech-heavy industries on the back end. We wanted to bring it to the mainstream. How do you do that? Music app. Bob Dylan, did everybody see those ads on Super Bowl? That was my team. Music industry. What else did she want to do? Fashion. I don't know. I sent a bunch of our millennials out, and I said, go find me a fashion story. Come on in. Mar Marquesa dress. Gen vets. Go find me a vet. Found a vet. So we started what and an incredible thing happened is, for me, I had to build a team. I started with two, ended up with 200 and they were all millennials, all your age. So here I am, kids basically as old as I'm, I'm now managing and learning, and I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? And I learned so much from working with the millennials, and all of you, and I think you're not millennials anymore, right? What are you? Gen Z, I don't know, I kept, my kids correct me all the time. Okay, Gen Z, but not, I'm now hiring Gen Zs. But four years ago, we were hiring millennials. And I have to say that one thing that I learned and something that I think we learn now as you guys go into the workforce is the coexistence of talent. Um, you need both. And I learned that very quickly because I had a lot of my peers that are like, oh, I don't want to work with those young kids. You know, it's like babysitting. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You give them guardrails and they're off. Like, you know, the energy, the passion. And more than anything, when you're trying to do something net new in the technology world, we don't know it inherently. We just don't. You do. You were born with a phone in your hand and not a bag phone. And, uh, sir, I, you know, I wish I had it. I got rid of it, and I really need to start carrying it around. I actually was looking for pictures of the bag phone and the brick. And, um, and you're uh, digitally savvy. And now technology has penetrated every part of the business. And the people to go find it are the people that are digitally savvy, right? And so it's in fashion. It's in makeup. So my daughter, I'll tell this quick story and I'll keep going. My daughter, um, when she went and did her ACTs, she got a perfect on science, 36 out of science and math. You would never tell because she's a cheerleader, dancer, just like me, but she, you know, I didn't put guardrails on her, so she has a very big personality. 36 on her science and math, and she ends up going into fashion. But I took her to New York City and we went to FIT because I learned at FIT they had a lab on the 13th floor. They had a chemistry lab. And it's still a fashion, it's through the Fashion Institute, and it's making makeup and perfume. And that is technology. So I forgot who here is in the, somebody said that they were in computer science and you. 
See, there's, it, 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 go for it. I mean, sir, there are so many things that you can do that are so cool with technology and an engineering degree that you don't even think about. You know, clothing, like I, right now we work in, we're working on making skin from 3D printers. I, I, you know, I'll tell you where I am right now, but, but that's, you know, it, it, it breaks my heart, but what that taught me is that there is so many things that you can do with technology, just go find it. And that's what I learned from the millennials. That's what I learned from being in Watson, is that technology wasn't just for B2B anymore, it was B2C. And that totally excited me, so I'm like, okay, I gotta go do something. Life is too short, my kids are off in college, I want to do something that matters because now I'm at that age. So I have this, my husband and I have this belief that in life you have three stages. You learn in your young age, then you earn your maximum earning capacity, and then you got to return. So I feel like I'm in the returning phase. Not that I don't want to still make money because I, I do, but um, I think we all do because I like to live my life the way I have my shoes and my clothing. But, um, but life is too short. I mean, I've learned that I've lost a couple of people. I lost my father in January. And I still haven't recovered yet. It's just he was my ground rock. I mean, he made me who I am as an Asian woman in technology because if it wasn't for my father, who was an immigrant from India, I would never be where I am. He's the one who pushed me into it, who supported me when I said I wanted to quit, and allowed me to, to, to do what I needed to do in order to succeed. And so, you know, thank all of your parents for, A, paying for your college or helping you get here one way or another, whether they're paying for it, supporting you, helping you get through, mentally, emotionally supporting you because it's critical. When you sit where I sit, it's your foundation. Um, so I work for GE Healthcare now, and I'm doing one of the funnest things. Remember, I keep going after the new thing. AI, we're putting AI into medical devices. It is so fun. So I'm here for two things, and uh, once that's done, I might have to go find the next shiny thing. Um, I want to save boobs and babies. And I say this publicly when I publicly speak on top of conferences, and I'm not ashamed of it because we make mammography machines, and we do fetal heart, fetal brain, we do ultrasound machines. And my goal in life is that not one more of my friend is going to have to lose her breast because we didn't detect breast cancer early enough. And not one more baby will be born without us knowing that there's a defect that they can treat it right, either in room or outside. So we're putting artificial intelligence into, think of self-driving cars, and we're doing self-driving machines, medical devices. And that is called healthcare IoT. And I am in marketing, believe it or not. Um, so I have taken that windy road, and I have ended up in marketing, and I love it. And I think when I look at the roles that I've had throughout where I am and why I got chosen to do what I'm doing, and I, I feel like I think I'm doing okay. You guys will see because we're launching something big in, um, in November. And um, I, I, I think the ability that I learned throughout where I started here, physically here, and to where I landed to where I am today, it's been a very windy road, as I just explained to you in a very long time, 40 minutes. Um, but I think that that's how you have to look at it. Like, if I, if I can leave you with that, it's like it's a journey. You know, what is yours? So I'm going to leave you with some really quick tips, okay? As you guys go out interviewing for the seniors that are out there, and as you go into your internships, three things as women in technology, okay, STEM. Men, you guys can listen to. Um, be visible, all right? Communicate with impact. I know this is things that you've all learned before, but I'm going to throw it back into your head again. And be confident and assertive. Don't be scared of that. So when I say be visible, network and network hard. I tell this to my children. LinkedIn, in the corporate world, if you want to join the corporate world, and even in academia, LinkedIn is God. That's what we use. That's how I recruit. Um, and also be careful, and I'm not your mother and your father, but I will tell you, be careful of social media because I work for an AI company, and I worked at IBM, and I know what we do before we hire anybody. So those red solo cups on Thirsty Thursdays are um, okay, but make sure you're not like, you know, I'm, I'm not joking. We look at it. And, it. and if I'm looking at two candidates, and I see, you know, in my IT department, if I want to do a, a background check, which a lot of companies do now, um, so just be careful of what you do. Snapchat, they think it doesn't last forever, but it does. And, uh, you know, security is, is key. So be careful of what you do. But network, network all the time. I think every interaction you have, even at the grocery store line, I meet people all the time. Find a mentor. That was my key. I found a mentor throughout my entire life and my entire career is finding a mentor. Young, old. I have mentors that are younger than me. They're millennials. Like, I, I coach them. They coach me. And I think that's one of the biggest things I learned at my, motor, at my IBM job was that it's a two-way street. 
you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna coach and mentor, I mentor a lot of ladies in Chicago and um, and outside as well. And I ask in return that they educate me because I, I need to get smart as well. So it's a two way street. Build your brand, build it now. Like when they say Rita Jackson, what do they see? What do they know? And it's a brand that I've been working on since I was sitting in your seat. And it has changed, believe me, over time. But I'm very territorial of my brand, what's in, what's out, and how I represent myself. Um, and my private life is my private life, right? So I, I think that's the one thing I always tell my children, and I'll tell you as well. Private life is different than your social business life. I think you need to, I, I coach all of the people that are on my team. You know, of course, be personal and all of that, but be careful, just be careful, because the internet is never secret. And build your tribe, men and women. I think building your tribe, especially women, we need, our, we need each other, um, and we gravitate towards each other as we go through and navigate through this thing called life and technology, um, because there's highs that are highs, and let's celebrate each other. Let's not bring each other down. And, um, and when you're down, go reach out to somebody. They'll bring you up, because that's, that's what we do as girls. It's what we do, right? We learned that from the very beginning. You know, and, and I, I, I'm honest, it, it was a tough six months for me. I finally came out of my rut back in July, but it was hard, and it was my girlfriends and my posse that got me through. And, um, and I built them throughout the years, and not all of them are engineers, but a lot of them are. Uh, communicate with impact. So when I say talk, I don't mean just talk. Be relevant. I always say active listening and active talking. Be active. You know, when you're going to say something, have an opinion. Um, leverage social media. Build a brand. Build it good, though, because we're all watching. And um, tell a story. I, you know, I'm a storyteller. If that's one thing you learned from me in the last 45 minutes, it's all about stories. It's being engaged. So, you know, if you can tell something, especially in technology and engineering, we sometimes forget about the storytelling. But you have it in you. You know, we're all, you know, when you're writing code, you're really writing a story. So communicate and communicate with impact. And lastly, be confident and be assertive. Um, speak up, be passionate, and if you're not passionate, find something else. Follow your dream. Uh, my daughter says flying on a unicorn. You guys all probably know what that is. I'm going to fly around on my unicorn. Um, and when you go in somewhere, have an agenda. I think we talked about that today. Rambling on, talking with no mission, no, nobody wants to listen, right? So if you're going to be going into a meeting, you're going into an event, you're going into anything, know what you want to say. You don't have to write it down, but know how you want to say it. Be confident about it do some research, and, and make an impact, girls. I mean, seriously, it's the time is right. So I'm going to leave you. <laughs> That's another one of my mottos. I mean, my team hates me when I do this. Leave me alone. I got it. Leave me alone, boys. Um, this is a, I have a little, um, I have a, a group that I started, and um, we're calling it the Superwomen. It's a private little group. It's uh, people that come into my life. We go for coffee or um, once every quarter. And uh, that's our little logo. It's a little bat, bat, bat sign. Um, because we all grew up, I mean, there's, they're all ages. I mean, I have a woman that's been in technology for, gosh, longer than I have. She's in her 60s. And uh, I have young ladies that are in their 20s. And we just get together for coffee to exchange ideas and how um, we're going to transcend and we're going to take over the world. And so um, create your own journey, ladies. All of you have a different path. you know. And so 30 years later, they'll ask you to come back and keynote. And this room will be... Triple. They won't even be able to fit it in here. We'll have to have it in an auditorium somewhere where there's thousands of young ladies. So aspire to do that because I am so proud. Um, be visible. Communicate with impact. Seriously, and really be confident. You know that whole thing. Lean in. I'm. Be, I'm totally serious. Do it. It's how I got to where I am many, many times. And go make history because you are on the cusp of it. It's all in your hands. Our future is in your hands. I'm not joking. Go for it. Go after your dreams, and you're going to do it. I did it. I'm a product of U of I, and I'm really proud of it. So be proud. It's a great university. So any questions? I think I kept on time even. Look at this. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, like, when you uh, were at your first job and you said you learned a lot from the people there that were much older than you, et cetera, what did you think was a good way, like, what was your, what's your, like, question policy for when, especially when you don't know about things, but, like, the way to gain respect and that is? Humble. Okay. You have to be really humble, which is really hard. <laughs> it is. I mean, I find this in all of us, I mean, myself included. 
right? Um, I think eating a little bit of humble pie every so often. And sometimes you don't have to be the expert in the room. Uh, let somebody else have the spotlight sometimes, but don't not always. Don't let them take your ideas. But I think being humble and asking the question. I ask a lot of questions because I don't know everything, especially right now I'm dumb. In healthcare, I don't know anything about healthcare. I know AI like the back of my hand, you know, except for the data scientists that are in the room. I don't, I'm not as smart as you. I am going to learn, though. I learned from her that you've got a master's in data science that I'm, I'm going to have to start to learn. But I, I, I think it's just asking the questions and being humble and listening, like hone in on the listening skills. That's what I learned. So keep going. So to follow that up, then, when you're trying to balance that humility and have that, especially when you don't know things, how did you know um, how to balance that with when you were like asking for things? So when you were at Platinum or even by CA, where you hadn't asked for things already, how did you know that, like, oh, I deserve this, but I don't need to be humble here and be like, oh, of course I should be working five days a week. Like, where <laughs> you're allowed to ask for Yeah, you know. A good question. Um, and I, I'm not, I, I shouldn't admit this to you guys, but I think a lot of it was just emotion. Like I, I had to read the room. I had to read my boss. And then I, I had to be humble. You, you know, I, I went in with humble. You know, I, I was um, just said I want to work. And, you know, and it could have gone either way, guys. I mean, it really could have. And, and I was prepared for that. I was prepared to, for him to say no. Every single time I walk in, I'm prepared for that, you know, go pack up your box. We, we, this isn't going to work. I mean, I, I do that even today. I, you know, I go in, and if the answer is no, okay. But you have to be ready for it. You know, before you go in, you have to be prepared for the answer you don't want. And I was. I was prepared for that. And so I think, you know, be careful what you ask for. I tell my team that all the time because everybody wants to move up the ladder, and they want to do certain things, and they want it their way. But be prepared for the, the answer that you don't want to hear, right? It's just like when you go ask your kid, your parents for the car keys and they say no, right? You can't have a fizzy fit with your boss. But um, I think just be prepared, you know, for the no. And I was. And I, I, I you know, I, I talked about successes. I was told no quite a bit. You know, I mean, like that time at CA when I left and I took the time off, that was a no. And I said, okay, fine. I'll go find something else to do. And the no could come tomorrow for me, right? And so uh, I'm prepared. So, but that's that's how I live my life, and I'm teaching my children to live the life. Is that be prepared? You know, when you go and ask for something, um, know that there's a yes and a no, and and know what to do when the yes happens, and know what to do when the no happens. So have a backup plan. It's just like applying for colleges and jobs, right? Same thing. You know, if you don't get your first school, go to the second. If you don't get your first job, you go to the second. You make the best out of it, and it's probably a fate. I believe a lot in fate. I know that's really spiritual, but I do. I think there's a path for everybody, and um, and you have to go after it. But I also think some parts of it is you just got to go with the flow sometimes. You can't get all stressed out. I learned that over time, too. Um, I learned that in my last job at IBM. I, I can't control everything. I can control my life. So, yes? I love the life of having such a big corporation and making that like, jump to... Oh my God. It's like me moving from my 6,000 square foot home in Chicago suburbs to 1,800 in Chicago four weeks ago. Princess problems. Um, you know, I was at a point in my life because I was in my late 20s and early 30s, and the startups were just starting. So it was, remember I told you I'd go after that silver, the sexy new thing? Um, I loved it because when I was at the big company, I felt that I had outgrown it. And I know that sounds really weird, but when you're at a big company, which I'm at right now, um, but I know how to navigate it now, and I have a lot more tools in my toolbox, which you guys are just starting to get the tools in your toolbox, um, is I, um, I love the fact that I wasn't boxed into being this. So I found it invigorating. But there are others that will not. So what I warn people with on startups is that if you are the kind of person that likes to have a box and a path, that doesn't always happen. At startups, they're basically, I'm living in a startup within a big company, and I shift every three weeks, guys. My team doesn't know what to do with us. Sometimes every, you know, four, three months, three weeks in Watson was a long time. So you have to learn to be able to ping pong and shift and go with the, with the tone. But that's not for everybody. So it's not. And if, you, if that's not for you, then don't go there, right? There's 
lots and lots of other companies that'll give you the guardrails and will show you the path and maybe make it a big guardrail or a small guardrail. When you go to a startup, if it's truly a startup, which is what I did, um, you're the jack of all trades. And if you love that, I love it. It was good for me. Now, do I want to go back there again? Um, maybe. I think, now maybe not a startup now. I think it was a lot of work. Um, I'd like to go to somebody that's got a Series A, Series B, um, and maybe not a Series C, but I really want them to get past their angel funding. And I was not at there. We didn't even have Series A, so we were scrappy. So, other questions? Yes. So you mentioned trying new things to figure out what you like and what you don't like. How much time do you give something before realizing that I really don't like this and I should try something else? Oh, we all are women. We have six senses. Don't you, like, can't your gut tell you? I mean, like, oh, gosh. Um, I'm not a patient person, so it depends on you. Um, I think life is short, and I think life is meant to be lived. So. Um, if I don't like something, I'll give it, my husband will give it a year, like in a job. I give it six months. Um, but that I, I think you really should give it a year um, because it takes about a year to learn something new in a technology world. But I think at the point that I'm at in my career, um, I know right away if I'm going to like it or if I'm going to be able to learn it. So I think that's something else that I, I should tell you guys is that as you're growing in your career, know what you're good at and what you're not good at, and that'll help you make that decision. I am not good at sales, and I am not good at programming C++ in a computer that doesn't know how to compile. So I'm gonna go learn how to program again in TensorFlow and all this other SageMaker stuff. After coming out of this, I'm inspired. Um, and, and maybe I'll like it again. I mean, I, it, it was hard. You know, I loved the programming part of it. I didn't like the debugging part of it, which I think technology has changed. So know what you're good at, um, because I know what I, I mean, I learned that. And if once you learn what you like to do and what you're good at, and then more importantly, what you're not good at, you'll naturally know. And you won't even gravitate towards that. I know if someone's going to offer me a CPA job or a finance job, I am like, no way. I'm not, no way. Stay away. I don't like it. Um, I'll do it if you ask me to, but I prefer to go be on the technology side, bringing things to life and creating markets. So, does that help? Yeah. You should take it, learn for a little bit. Don't be like me and spontaneous. Um, when you were coming back to the work, work first, workforce after a few years off, um, what were things that you, how did you make sure you were still like relevant and able to get a job that like the, mm -hmm. this, what things kind of, you know, did you have to relearn or like catch up on or anything like that? Gosh, three years in technology world when you were working in the 90s and 2000s was a long time. Um, so I went back to something that I knew, which was data, database management. I had kept in touch. Remember the thing I talked about networking? I stayed networked. I did a lot of, they didn't call them meetups back then, coffees. And um, I read a lot. And remember I told you I um, did my own little startup consulting company? I kept up. But that's me, right? I was not the one that, I, I was bored sitting in an HMO meeting all day talking about party planning and the types of paper we were going to get, because my mind is like, okay, how am I going to create the paper? Or like, you know, how do I make this process faster? Or, you know, how, where's the agenda? So I think it was just keeping fresh and networking. I mean, I stayed networked. I didn't completely leave the workforce. I kept my fingers in it. And that's why I think I decided to go back into technology. I have, on the other hand, a lot of friends. Unfortunately, you know, I told you 56% don't, you know, leave. Um, a lot of them left technology and they went into something different. So a career shift is also something that, that happens mid-career. I just love technology. I can't see myself doing anything else. I blame U of I for that. But, um, you know, I just can't see myself doing anything else. I, I'm really dying that I don't have the latest new iPhone. And I did go get earbuds yesterday. Like I, those phone, what do you call those? iBuds? Earbuds? Yeah, because I, I, I want to look cool with the little white things hanging on my ears. Come on. And so, you know, I, it's just, a, it's a curse. So, you know, and it might not be for you, right? I mean, if you decide to stay home, you might decide that you like something. I did real estate. I got my license in real estate. I was buying and selling real estate. I ended up creating a website for my, I mean, I was that bored. Raising my children. I mean, this is what I did at night to keep my brain going. 
And so, but I decided I didn't like the real estate side of it. I just really didn't like it. I mean, I was good at it. I didn't, it wasn't my passion. I wasn't waking up every day. Oh my God, you know, what house am I going to sell today? It was more of how am I going to do this more faster and more efficient with a computer? So that is, right? You know, you might learn that the skills that you're learning here today in computer science might lead you to a different path, but go for it. I mean, it, it, because right now, I, I believe this, we're on the verge of everything being taken over by technology. That's my belief. You know, self-driving cars, self-driving everything, right? Look at Amazon. I mean, come on. You can buy stuff now and put your phone down and you walk out. I mean, I was telling these ladies, I was, I, I was playing a game with my son. We have an Amazon Go store right by me. You, they know what you have. Like, even if we both go, we're taking a water bottle, walking around and moving things all over the place, like a jigsaw puzzle, and you walk out with something different, they know. And so I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. So technology is going to be everywhere. So, I mean, don't be scared, and don't think that what the first job you get is the last one. Believe me, I'm on my seventh or eighth, and I, I don't think that that is a bad thing these days. I think you need to go after your passion, but give it time. Don't, like, jump, 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 jump. I think you need to give it some time. Um, especially as young professionals, you have to give it some time to settle in and understand, learn how to translate what you got in, as an education, how that translates into the workforce, the other skills you're going to need in your toolbox that a lot of companies will give you, um, and then just go from there. Your path will take you wherever it's supposed to be. You'll know. You can't plan it today. Thank you. Thank you. We have a small gift for you that you should see you have, uh, to kind of show you something about appreciation. Um, one of our students engraved this. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and, oh, thank you, Fred. Thank you so much. Thank you coming. so much.